I want to tell you this. During this past year, a lot of people that we may have known or known of are not here. They, 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 they purpose had came to an end. But God saw fit to allow you to see this day. This day to allow you to still fulfill the purpose that God has destined and designed in you. We can't take that for granted. Every day we wake up new mercies. Every morning, new mercies. New mercies, new mercies. I have a chance to fulfill the purpose that God has destined me to do. Isn't he worthy and honor, awesome for that? Isn't he worthy and awesome for that? There's some things that God wants to do in us that he's been giving us dreams and, and giving us desires. And we, we feel like we don't have a chance. But every day we wake up and breathe the air that he gave us. We get another chance to fulfill our destiny. We get another chance to fulfill our purpose. That's why we say, great are you, Lord. That's why we call you great, God. For that reason alone. For you are the life breather. For you are the destiny maker. For you are the purpose driver. For you are the architect of our life. Great are you, Jesus. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, God. God, you're awesome. All right. Put your hands together, y'all, for, for this morning. Come on, we can do better than that. Put your hands together for this awesome, amazing God we serve. Come on, we can do better than that. I want us to get the attention of heaven. Put your hands together for this awesome, marvelous God that we serve. Hallelujah. 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 God, you're awesome. I'm going to get right into it. I'm not going to be here for a long time, y'all. Letting y'all know. We about to go through this. God had gave me his word uh, earlier in the week. And I kind of just been sitting on it and um, God kind of kept me hushed. I don't know any of you guys, like when you're in school and you're preparing for an exam or preparing for a paper and, and you might have it written ahead of time and then you, like, you want to touch it, you want to change it, you want to do whatever. And then sometimes, what do they say, your first, um, thank you. See, these wise men, you know. And so I literally, like, left it alone. So, because I'm an intellectual dude. Brother Mike can understand. We, we can get in our own way, overthink the things, and we gotta like, sometimes you just gotta let it be and leave it alone. Well, today, we gonna let God do his thing, amen? I'm coming out right now in the book of Psalms. First, let me give honor to God for being ahead of my life for his awesomeness and his amazing works. I also wanna give honor to our pastors in their absence, Pastor Tim. Pastor Renee Hawthorne, give put your hands together, y'all. Come on, we gotta we can do better right now. Come on, y'all. Y'all will clap louder if you get a day off at work. <laughs> I just seen this scream. I want to give honor to our pastors and all the leaders. I also want to give honor to my beautiful wife, uh, Prophet Deborah Yancey. She um been with me during this whole time and we've gotten on each other's nerves. I don't know what it is. Every time one of us got a minister, we find a way to get on each other's nerves. But when it's all said and done, we will pray each other through it and we will have each other's back. But we get on each other's nerves regardless. I, right, that's our love language. We just draw each other nuts. Thanks, Brother Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I also want to give honor to all the leaders in their absence and uh, traveling those um, in here. All right, I'm coming out of Psalms 139, uh, verses 13 through 16. 
when you have it, can we please stand in honor of the, the word of God? Like I said, I'm going to try to, I'm going to get through this real quick so we can go home, or go on our way, get our crab legs or whatever we're trying to go eat. Hey, amen. I don't know. Remember a few years ago, it was no crab joints in the city, and now it is like 50 of them. <laughs> no, 139. Verses 13 through 16. We'll get our crab legs and our buffets, the buffets of the world. To serve food. Y'all laughing, I'm serious. We was on a bad dash at looking for a Waffle House to be open. And they will only have one worker in there and be a line full of people. But they run, I was upset. And they was like, let's go to White Castle. Line is around the corner. Like that, baby, we ain't built for this. We too grown. We too old. Man, we can't be hanging out like that. <laughs> All right, let me know when you have everybody say amen. amen. All right, it says, and I'm thinking I'm reading from the New King James, it says, For you have formed my inner parts. You have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when, it, when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest places, parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they, are all were, they all were written. The days fashioned before me, when as yet were none of them. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just come to you right now just thanking you, God. Thank you for everything you've done doing it. By faith, the things that you're going to do, God. We give you honor and glory. We worship you, for you are awesome and amazing, God. I ask you right now, Father, to search my heart, Lord. Search within me, God, and whatever is not pleasing to you, I ask that you remove it right now, Father, that I may decrease and that you may increase through me, God. I even ask right now that your minister and angels go before me. Let them be the first representative that is seen before my verse is even heard. I ask you, God, that you anoint the ears of the people that don't listen. Massage their hearts so their hearts can be prepared to change. And I ask that you show up in a mighty way, God. Do you, God. You be you, God. Right now in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So, if I will have a title for my message, it would be, you are destined for greatness. The subtitle will be, Get Out of the Cave. Amen? So, in this particular part of the Bible, what we have David here is he's speaking to God and, and acknowledging what God has done in the time of his life and upbringing. David was being accused as being disloyal to God. That's why he was in the place of hiding in this particular situation. And during this time, David was acknowledging that God knew everything about him. How many know that God knows everything about you? All your ins and outs, your thoughts, your, your desires, your wants and needs and your concerns. He knows everything about you. Even when David called himself hiding, he knew that he couldn't hide from God. David is saying that God knows everything about us in this particular part, even before we even existed. So what's crazy about it is that we couldn't even hide from God before our own existence. Think about that. Before you was even brought on this earth, God knew you. So in um, the Bible, it says in Jeremiah 1 through 5, before I formed you, I knew you. We say that a lot of times. I knew you before you were even formed. In verse 13, it speaks about how he formed our inner parts, our heart. It says, you formed my inner parts. Then it goes to say that you covered me in my mother's womb. Cover is a word that means protection. The heart is the precious, most precious thing of the body because it's where the blood flows. It's where everything goes through to make everything work. Once the heart stops working, 
everything goes away. And so when God first formed the heart, and I don't know if anyone ever been in like a health class or anatomy class, they talk about the forming of the, the, the fetus, the, the, the embryo. The first thing you see is the heart. That's the first thing that's formed when the cells begin to do is multiplication. I'm giving y'all a little health exam right now, health, little health lesson going back to fifth grade. Uh, the first thing that is formed is the heart. And you see the heart flowing and the blood begins to go as the, the body pretend, um, begins to exist. But when God first pre, um, formed that part, he immediately protected it because of its vitalness. And then he says, um, after that, he says in verse 14, he says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So I started thinking about how do we understand what it means to be fearfully and wonderfully made. We say it a lot. And a lot of people emphasize on the word wonderful because we know what wonderful means. But the fearful part people don't necessarily understand because when we associate fear, we associate being afraid or scared or, or timid or concerned or worried. But in this particular fearfulness is completely different than what we may think. Fearfully, when translated in the Hebrew, means great reverence, heartfelt interest with respect. So God, we are made with great reverence. I mean, I'll just, uh -huh, that, that's good. He put you in, ref, in reverence when you were created. Uh, interest that is heartfelt, which means a lot. We have a lot of interests in life, and things that we're interested in and, and concerned, and, and we want that, and we would drive ourselves crazy to get those things that we're interested in. But imagine that the creator of all has saw a heartfelt interest in when he was creating each one of you all. And then it states, it says that with respect, so you were put in this place and, and honored and, 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 and heartfelt and, and respected in the way that you were made. Wonderfully, when translated in, he in Hebrew, means unique and set apart. So we were created to not fit in. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So I just want to give you guys a little bit of encouragement. When God took all that time to make us and fearfully and wonderfully make us, we are considered a masterpiece. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor you are a masterpiece. Y'all don't believe it. Yeah. I'm going to need y'all to get a little more excited than that because being a masterpiece, I don't, if you know what, you ever heard of Mona Lisa or, or some of these big, huge, but wonderful um, um, art pieces that are valued and and if you even try to touch it, you will go to jail for years and years and years. You are worth more than that. God, you're so awesome for taking the time to make me a masterpiece. See, this is where it first has to start within ourselves. We seek validation from other people to call us a masterpiece, but the one who created the other people already deemed us a masterpiece. You can't get no higher than that. So you gotta believe yourself that I am a masterpiece. David knew that God was that God was a precise God. He took great thought in what he had made. Like an award-winning architect who has designed some of the greatest structures in this world. And we have we call those structures marvels. You ever heard of you ever watch like National Geographic or or uh, the finest things on one of them shows or whatever when they show these structures and these buildings and the nine wonders of the world or how many it is now I don't know and they talk they call them marvels this particular marvel and this particular I know some of us think about marvel we really think about Iron Man and Hulk and and Bat and, and, and uh, uh, I almost messed up and, uh, and Black Panther ain't Batman that's DC Comics I know better I'm a nerd too but a lot of us think about the Iron Man and, and Avengers, but God calls us marvels. Marvels. Marvel, the noun means it causes wonders or an astonishment. 
And then to marvel at something, which is the verb, it is to feel perplexity, which means an ability to deal with complicated. Mm. Turn to them and tell your neighbor I'm complicated. I'm complicated. You ever see that on Facebook with your race relationship status? They're like, it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated because you can't figure it out. When you are a marvel, people won't understand who you are. They, you, they, they will be confused with who you are. But you yourself can't be confused with who you are. You have to know who you are and whose you are. That's why God, that's why David goes and says after that, marvelous are your works. If you're marvelous, that means you have to only create marvelous things. And we are created by the marvelous one which makes us marvelous in his eyes. Then it also goes to say, verse 15, it says, our frame wasn't hidden, which is our body. God wasn't ashamed of us, even though he created us in secret. It says that he created us in secret, but the reason why he created us in secret is because we were precious. He was skillful enough to create us in the dark. When the Bible word says in, in, channel, in uh, verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought, which means created, designed, worked in the lowest parts of the earth. The lowest parts in the earth, if you look it up, is literally considered um, um, a place they often call it Sheol which is the realm of the dead. So God created us in a dark place in order for us to shine outside of that darkness. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, it says the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse three says, then God says, let there be light. And then there was light. How many of y'all know that God does his best work in the dark? Mm. Yes. <sighs> it was completely dark and then all of a sudden poof is light. Mm -hmm. So if he took his time to form us in a place of voidness and now we come out in his marvelous light, we are created to be Great. Verse 16, like I said, I'm not going to be here. I'm already at 16. Verse 16 states that his eyes saw my unformed body. Our unformed body is similar to when a, a mother is carrying a baby and they're carrying an embryo or a fetus and they have to carry them for such a long time or it will be too early for them to come out and they will not be able to feel fit to breathe our air or, or live in what's going on. He, he carefully protected us and, and, and he saw us in our unformedness. When a, a fetus in an embryo has not reached the fullness of development, but God still saw the fullness of our purpose. Give God praise today, y'all, for seeing the fullness of our purpose. God, then it says in further in 16, that in your book, it all were written in the days fashioned before me, and yet it was as yet there was none of them. So it states in here that God constructed our days and um, the days before us, we was even created, which means he just constructed our path of our destiny. And some of us may ask, why we go through certain things or why we deal through certain things or why these particular things happen in our life. It is the path of our destiny to, for us to become great. All right. I'm already on my last one, so we're about to be done. See, I told you, I'm going to be up here for a minute. Now go ahead and call your orders in now. <laughs> 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 All right, so we went through a lot of things in order for our life to be, for our greatness to rise. Our hurts and our pains is what make us great. 
The Bible says that we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. But the beginning of everything else, it says we are overcomers. To overcome something means that something at first was submerging above you, but you then was able to push it down so you can rise above it. Think about, you ever heard of someone saying survive and thrive? There's a difference between surviving and thriving. I imagine somebody in the water and, and they feel like they can't swim and they're in a doggy pedal. A lot of us been in that little doggy pedal mode for a lot of our lives. Just doing whatever we can do to keep our head above water. Like fighting and doing everything can do. We in all of our circumstances, all of our issues, all of our things, where who is my head? <laughs> I can swim, so I don't know. Some of y'all might like, I don't know about that. I don't get in the water. But other people you may have seen in the water may be doing this. They're trying to keep their head above water. But when we when God called us to thrive, He called us to overcome. And so word says that we are more than conquerors. We are to overcome. So when you go from this to on top of the water like this, that's what God calls us to be in our greatness. We are to be great. I'm about to be done already. Look, I'm trying to tell y'all this ain't going to be long. This ain't going to be long. I'm going to do this. I got a little demonstration, and then we're going to pray and be on out of here. So I was doing research about what greatness is, like people who are destined to be great. Destined to be great. I looked it up, and I found this article, and it bewildered me, not the right, bewildered me of what they said that these type of people are destined for greatness. And it's going to blow your mind how the world looks at greatness compared to what God says about greatness. They said these people are destined for greatness. They are first, not humble. That don't make sense. They said these people who are destined for greatness are first, not humble. They put everything on themselves and feel like it is them that would get them to greatness. Two, they're irrational. These are the people that the world says are destined for greatness. They don't think, they don't put things in, in proper context. They, they just do things as they feel. They are moved by their emotions. Two, they think for themselves. This is what the world says, how you get to greatness. Four, don't live a balanced life. And this is the one, the fifth one cracked me up. It says they are lucky. <coughs> how many of y'all may have thought and saw a person doing well and initially, initially in your mind you would say, man, they lucky. We don't believe in luck, we believe in favor. But the world says they're lucky. Then it says their personality, they realize that their personality can be learned. That's called an identity crisis. And then they don't worry about their weaknesses. And then the last one says they never fail. And this is the reason why we, a lot of us, are hindered when it comes to walking in the God-giving greatness that God called us to be in because we do all these same things on a regular basis when things don't go the way we don't go we were like I'm, I'm going to do this myself I don't need God I don't need no one else it's going to be me that's going to get me there and then you think years and years and years and years and you're still in the same place because you have moved God off the throne it don't matter what issue it is you have to give all of yourself into God. Irrational. When you're not thinking of the way of God and, and you're not able to come to this calm stillness to even hear God because your mind is all over the place. When God has asked you to come to him, he says, come to me that all that are heavy laden and I will give you rest. But no, we, 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 I, I'm a fuck. And you're yelling at everybody in your house and, and you're going off because this ain't working this way, this ain't working. Children are getting yelled at and being word cursed because of your ir 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 irrationality. Two, you think for yourself. 
It's all about you. It's not about God. Uh, Philippians. I'm going to Philippian through this Bible real quick. Uh, Y'all ain't catch that joke. It's okay. Uh, it's a little early. It is a little early. It says in Philippians 2 and 3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in the lowness of the mind, and keep the esteem. We, it's not about us. I, I was going to get this shirt. I'm going to still get it. I'm going to make it. It's called, it's bigger than me. I'm a big dude, so. You know, I'm, I'm as big as he, well. No, I'm taller, so. But I'm as big as he is. <laughs> so it's bigger than me. Because it's bigger than me. Our greatness is for the purpose of the kingdom. And we can't start thinking of individual self we have to think about what the reason why God has created us. Everything we do has to be God-centered. You know what I just learned this other day? One of my homies, I got a television show that I do. It comes on every Friday and um, Saturday on www.pgnetwork.com. Check it out at 8 o'clock. It, um, um, it's, it's on Roku and um, Amazon. But uh, <laughs> I met with this guy. He's a good friend of mine. He's a... He's a rapper by the name of Lee Sun. He's a minister first. He's a wonderful, wonderful artist. And he was telling me the revelation that he has gotten is that everything he do, it is driven by God, not driven by himself. Because if a person has a problem with you working through what God tells you to do, they can't get mad at you. They got to get mad at God. So don't take it up with me. Take it up with God. It will stop right then and there. Mm -hmm. So when we do things, the reason why God is calling us to do this great stuff is not because we want it. It's not because I want it. It's because God told me to do this. When we start changing our focus from what we desire and what the world sees and, and what we want, then, then we'll stop taking L's in life. You know what an L is, right? A loss. And you know what? If you take the L out of the world, you get the word. So we need to do what the word says and remove the L's out of our life. Look, hey, that, hey, that was good. Hey, that was good. I said, man, y'all over there staring at me. Like, I'm crazy. man, when God do that, do that at me, I almost hopped off the toilet. You know, God gave me something I'm on the toilet, little person. <laughs> no, but, right, amen. Right, God be talking to you on the toilet and the shop. What is with the bathroom? Our voice sound way better when we sing. We get God we got our undivided attention while we cleaning ourselves. Hey, look, I almost hopped off the toilet when he dropped that in my spirit. Remove the L out of your life. Remove the L out of the world and you get the word. My God. Uh, Reggie, I'm about done. You come on up here, man. I'm about done, bro. And then it says, um, they don't live balanced lives. That goes back to being irrational. We, our lives are so erratic, and, and then we people are going through things, they're saying, I'm overwhelmed, or ah, I, I'm, I, I can't deal with this, so much stress is going on, it's too much, it's, I got these children, I gotta do this thing at church, I got this thing with my job, I got this thing going on over here, going over there. You have to learn how to submit everything unto God, and he will give you balance. When we try to do it ourselves, we will always be in a position of unbalanced and overwhelmness. We have to first submit our will to God, and he will do the rest. He will, well, you know the coldest thing you can do is when you go to God and tell God, I don't know how to do this. Yes. If I had learned that years ago, I will probably be much further. A lot of us will probably be much further if we went to God and said, God, I don't know. But you do. Then it talks about personalities can, can be learned. We... Oh, I, someone told me this. They said, be yourself because everybody else is taken. I'm going to jump off the toilet on that one too. Be yourself, because God created you. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. 
He knew who you were when he created you. So why are we trying to maneuver and redo the manufacturer's creation? Not everything can be, uh, what's it called, a jailbroken. And, like, and my tech guys know what I'm talking about. When you jailbreak a phone or a computer or, or something to try to maneuver it to do what you want it to do. And then you know what happens when that thing messes up and you try to take it back to the manufacturer? The warranty is voided. Because you changed it from what it was initially designed for. Man, that was good too. Man. Hey, you know what? Hey, as long as if I get delivered, that's all that matters. I'm cool. The Bible rejoices over one. Hallelujah. And then they say, don't worry about weakness. When you try to cover up the weakness in you, that what makes you even weaker. For if he, if, when I'm weak, he makes me strong. And we don't, that, that's the same thing of going to God and saying, God, I don't know what I am doing. I need you to be strong in the areas of my weakness. And then the last one says they never fail. Failure is a blessing. Believe it or not. Failure is a blessing because what you learn in the midst of your failure, you learn what not to do. You learn what not to do and then you learn what to do the next time. When you are, a lot of us are afraid to walk in the purpose that God has us because we're afraid to fall and we're afraid to, and we're afraid to fail or, or, or be unsuccessful in the eyes of others. But in God, God already called us and ordained us to be great. One thing I noticed about every person in here, except for the babies that was carried, everyone walked in here. Every last person that came in here walked on their two legs. No one got rolled in here. No one crawled in here. We all walked, which means that we have all taken a fall before. None of us start walking immediately after birth. We start crawling, and then we boom, wobble, and then boom. But all of us have succeeded and overcame failures in life before. Hallelujah. We have all succeeded and overcome failures in life before. Which means that if we have failed, we can learn from that and still become successful. Michael Jordan, one of the most successful, greatest basketball players. I'm more of a LeBron fan, but we're a little bit sad right now because we just lost to the Phoenix Suns. And first round, it was rough, but Michael Jordan, one of the greatest basketball players in the world, got cut in his high school team. Cut. Cut. But he persevered and got better and better to become one of the best in the highest level of basketball. Uh, who was it? Uh, uh, the Mark Zuckerberg got fired. Uh, Steve Jobs got fired. Some of these people that have wonderful, great inventions and great success all were failures before. But we now, everyone, majority of people got an iPhone in their hand, or majority of people are using a, 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 a Microsoft computer, or most of us are watching. Um, Michael Jordan going to the Hall of Fame. We're seeing these success and realizing that they have once failed before. We are able to learn from the issues that we went through. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 and 10, after you have suffered for a little while, the grace of God who imparts his blessing and favor, who had called you into his own eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself complete, confirm, strengthen, and establish you, making you what you ought to be. Look, we should be giving God praise for that promise that's in his word, because God, you are awesome. In spite of all the things we went through, a lot of us have suffered a lot in life. A lot of us have suffered losses. A lot of us have suffered heartbreaks. A lot of us have suffered disappointments. A lot of us have suffered so many things, but the word says that he will complete, confirm, strengthen, and establish you, making you what you ought to be. So I got this little um, demonstration. You can play me a little something, um, Reggie. I got this little demonstration that I 
I, uh, I wanted to do it. Are y'all okay with that? Oh, come on, y'all. Come on. Let me. Come on. Now, something, man. Look, y'all know, I don't know. I do stand up comedy too, man. And we be needing energy. So I'm trying to make sure I don't go in that comedy mode. I start cracking jokes. Start clowning y'all, go D.L. Hughes. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, man, I hope this is going to work. So, the other day, God has showed me something about in the Bible where when, when I mentioned about how he formed us and he created us for a certain purpose. The Bible says that he had said, let us make man in our likeness in our, in our likeness in our image. So when God has gave me a, a demonstration of this is us. This is the dirt. This is us when God had formed us. And this is what God had brought his breath into us. This is God's pureness, our greatness that God has destined us and designed us to be. All right. So what happens is that we go through things in life. We go through hurt, and turmoil, and, and disgust, and despair. And so what little things change the fabric of who we are. Yeah. That that that's the heartbreak right there that we may have endured. Right. Thank you, baby. All right, we got one. cool. Give God praise for one. All right, then this is the shame that we may have dealt with. This is the identity crisis when we try to change who God has ordained us to be. This is the abuse. says we're great and we ask God how am I great when I look like this how am I supposed to be wonderful and fearfully made when I look like this and so what we try to do is we try to remove what is in us ourselves. and I can I can pinch I can get a spoon but uh, I wish I had a spoon I can get a spoon or something and all I'm doing is making it worse. See how it's getting darker and darker because I'm trying to maneuver it. I'm trying to change it myself. And then this is where the enemy tricks us. He tricks us and tells us, pour it out and start over. But if we pour it out, the cup then becomes void, which means it becomes dead. That's why people have committed suicide and, and thrown in the towel because we feel like there's no more chance that we have because my water can never be clear according to God. And this is where I want to tell you how we get delivered. Remember what I said about jailbreaking a device and you go into the manufacturer and it becomes, the, the warranty becomes void? When you go to God, the creator of who you are, he is the one that can clean you out. When you go and get more of what God is giving you in the initial, that's how you become clean. But see, when we're like this, you know, this week when we're doing our fast and our, our consecration, the focus was on children, right? But we take our frustrations and our sicknesses and our issues and our lack and then we transfer it into our children. Now our 
children are the same way that we were, and then they transfer it to their children. This is called a generational curse. But I want to tell y'all today that God wants to break the generational curses in our house. And how we do that is by going to the initial source who breathed life in us in the first place. The one that has fulfilled us. The one that has made us fearfully and wonderful. The one that has worked on our inner parts. The one that has, has developed the heart within us. The one that has made us who we are supposed to be, which is God. And then when you go to God and you get more of him, watch what he can do in your life. He can then get rid of all of the, the sickness, all of the hurt, yeah. all of the pain, all of the turmoil, yeah. all of the disgust, all of the unrighteousness. He then can make you who you are supposed to be yeah. when you go to him. But then this yeah. is what the great thing about it is. Because this is not the full potential that God had called us to be. God has called us to be great and wonderful people. So then we go to our full capacity of who God wants us to be. So now we can go to our children, and then we can pour into yeah. our children, and then we can change the destiny of our children. Yeah. And then our children can then change the destiny in their children. So then that, that thing does not have to be what it is anymore. Yeah. I, I need y'all to give God praise right now. Yeah. Yeah. So notice, it's not about what we can do. It's about what God will do when we allow him to do it. Amen. It's what happens when you let God do what he said he was going to do. I want y'all to give God praise right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The word says, behold, in 1 John 3 and 31, 3 one and three. Behold, what matter of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because he did not, because it did not know him. We are children of God, but the world don't know him. But we know him. And when you realize that you are a king's kid, it should then change the fabric of your thinking and of your mind and how you act. Two, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and He has, and it has not been revealed to what shall what uh, what, uh, what shall we be. We but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for He shall see Him as He is, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone, verse three, who has this hope in Him purify himself just as he is pure. Everybody standing to their feet right now. We about to be done. I, uh, uh, if you feel like you were in that situation of that cup